easy at all. Okay. So let's talk a little about organizational culture and just very briefly. This is very important too because if you want to make change and you don't pay attention to the culture of your organization or the organizations you're dealing with, are you going to do well? No, you're going to struggle mightily. So this does matter. Somebody give me a sense of uh, what organizational culture means. What is it? What does it do for us? Whether it's in the military or the private sector, we all have cultures. What's a component of organizational culture? What does it do for us? Please, in the back. I'll use the mic, sir. So one of the uh, aspects of organizational culture is, is risk and the perceptions of risk in that culture because it drive whether they are willing to adopt change. That's excellent. Okay, so that's great. So there's a common view of values, and I heard the word values over here. It's what matters to us. That's what organizational culture is about. Organizational culture varies from clan to tribe to branch of service. In the gym world, we have lots of different cultures across the interagency. All of you have struggled with this in the past decade plus. The rest of government should not be a pejorative to those of us who wear the uniform. We can get through this, but we have to understand it first. So that's the key here. And so it's exactly what you just said. These are the shared values and beliefs. They create right and left boundaries for us. They allow us to understand what is acceptable, what is non-acceptable. Okay? So that's important. And it allows for senior leaders to influence each other. Very important to us, okay? So we want to make change as leaders, change is continuous. We want to adapt to it. We want to have it work for us. And so uh, the classic iceberg chart, most of you have seen this one before. Um, it's a pretty good visual image because it speaks to us about if you want to make change, great, you can make superficial change. That's all that stuff below that you have to get after if you want to anchor your vision. And it takes a lot more than just communications. So if you were to describe the two different elements of direction that we have, you might say, for example, that managers are involved not so much in the superficial change, but in the day-to-day -day work. They work to support standards. They work to create an adherence to status quo. Standards are important, very important. They are less likely to take risk about which you just spoke. If you want to anchor, to embed in your organizational culture significant change that supports your vision, that is communicated on a regular basis, that pays homage to the previous vision but is adapting, then you need leadership. And that gets after those deep-rooted changes. Edgar Schein talks about two ways to do it, and you're familiar with these, and they are forms of um, embedding mechanisms and reinforcing mechanisms. So embedding mechanisms, that's being the role model. This is how you make that strong change. It's leading from the front. It is uh, doing first what you ask your teams to do so they understand that they can count on you, that you're competent, that you're professional, and they can trust you. Sometimes it's about uh, reward criteria. So let's think about it. How many of you served on a board here in the US military in some capacity? A selection board, a promotion board, almost all of you. So what do we do? We gather together. We, uh, we receive the instructions principally of the lead civilian authority in our service. In the Army, it's the Secretary of the Army. And uh, then we go after this process. I have found it to be a very straightforward process filled with great integrity. You move through those files rapidly, but at the end of the day, I think it works. And then what happens when you're out there, not on the board, and you get the results? What do you do? Three things sometimes that you do. What's the first thing you do? You find out if you were selected to come to the United States Army War College or for Brigade Command or whatever the next miracle is. Sometimes you move rapidly to find out who was on that board, don't you? That's the human dimension. That's normal. But there's another element that we do, and that is we look to the instructions of that senior civilian authority because we're looking for clues to where the culture may be moving. And certainly there's been a lot of movement in the past couple of years. The requirements for strategic leaders have changed. We've learned from our campaigns. And so an embedding mechanism is to take a look at the criteria that we're facing so that we can move in that direction. 
And in doing so, we anchor the change. Reinforcing mechanisms, let me just mention two. So, uh, Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City. How many from New York City or the Empire State? Very good. It's wonderful you admit that. Are you wearing a parka? My son's at Sackett's Harbor. It was 33 degrees below zero in January when he reported to the Golden Dragons. Welcome to New York State. So, Michael Bloomberg leaves the financial world, becomes the mayor of New York. What does he bring with him when he uh, moves to City Hall? How did he change the physical layout of his command and control? The bullpen. The bullpen. Tell me a little about that, Colonel Smith. What's that mean? Sir, he removed the physical barriers to communications among his staff. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting concept, and it's about a reinforcing mechanism for his vision of leadership. Here's what he did. So on Wall Street, in the financial world, he lived in the bullpen. bullpen. And so this was open cubicles, the whole team around him, lots of transparency and everything that he was doing, depending on how he was feeling that day. So instead of going into the ceremonial room that some of you have probably seen in New York City at City Hall, he went in there for ceremonies, period. His office was in the large room in the middle of City Hall, and it was another bullpen that he created. And he had his, his team around him, and there must have been, on the last visit, we had probably 45 people crowded into that room, a lot of noise, that's what he was used to. A very interesting approach. So sometimes just rearranging the furniture makes a difference. Here's another one. Myths, stories, and legends in our cultures are reinforcing mechanisms. Why? Because of what you said down here a couple minutes ago. It's about our values. We talk about Sergeant Ryan Pitts. We are so proud of his courage and his leadership that we tell that story as we should because it speaks to the Army's values and the values of the U.S. military and the values of this nation. So. Myths, legends, stories. Let's take a look at one here. Okay, I know. I'm not going back to the president of the class, okay? And historians, you can't talk about this. So let me lay the groundwork. Some of you are familiar with this. You can see the date. So what's going on here? It's the Boxer Rebellion, yes? Okay, the last of the Manchus, the Dowager Empress, what does she do? She takes hostages from the foreign legations in what is then known as Peking. And so an international relief expedition is created, and they move by various means of transportation. Finally, a great foot march from the coast towards Peking. The Russians are in this, too, with us. Can you imagine that? Okay, so French, German, English, U.S. So here's a pivotal moment. This U.S. company, actually there are two of them, from the 14th Infantry, approaches the wall on the east side of this great fight, and they gather at the base, and the two company commanders are a little uncertain. They're not sure what to do, frankly. They bring their subordinate leaders forward, and they think for a minute. They're taking fire. They don't know how to go up. Clear that fire, because they are the linchpin in order to open up the walled city. Up steps a young soldier. Anybody know his name? Raise your hand, please. <laughs> and identify yourself, not as an historian, I hope. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, good. Oh, good to see you. Yeah. So, name again. Calvin P. Titus. And what did he say to the leadership of the 14th Infantry? I'll try, sir. Magic words, okay? Magic words. I'll try, sir. And this is the motto of the 14th Infantry, as it is of some other regiments. Perhaps some of you have been in this regiment. Yes? No? You all wanted to be, okay? So what does he do? He says, I'll try, sir, and he leads the way. Now, this is a somewhat mythical representation. Perhaps the American flag of that size was not waving from the parapet at the end of the fight, but he climbs up there. He puts his Springfield over his right shoulder, climbs up, leads the infantrymen to the top. They clear the inflating fire. They accomplish the mission. The gates are opened. The relief expedition prevails. Victory. It's a great story on a lot of levels. So, what was his military occupational specialty? Anybody know what it was? What did he, was he an infantryman? No, because it wouldn't make an interesting story, would it? Come on. So, what do you think he was, anybody? Sir? He was a chaplain's assistant, and he did something else. 
You wouldn't be a chaplain, would you? Are you, are you gloating or smiling? All right, very good. Bless you. So what else did he do? He was a musician. He was a bugler. So what was he? He was an emerging leader. We love emerging leaders. It's part of our culture. This story speaks to us about our values. It speaks to us about heroism, character, initiative. We love this. He climbs up there, saves the day. I'll try, sir. What happens to him? He's given an appointment, as General Rapp knows, to become a cadet at the United States Military Academy. In 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt comes to West Point and presents him with the Medal of Honor. Wonderful story. He has a full career as a colonel. Perhaps he's not selected for the Army War College. It's OK. <laughs> he did very well. It's a grand story. In fact, a couple years ago, we named a roll-on, roll 